This video covers the concept of caching in modern CPUs and provides a brief overview of caching operations that occur in a modern CPU. CPUs operate in nanoseconds. They are really fast. However, RAM or main memory is, has a high latency and getting data from memory can be slow. For example, CPUs can operate in nanoseconds while reading data from memory can take about 50 nanoseconds, even in some of the fastest RAM modules that we have today. So if the CPU is directly coupled with RAM that is slow, then even a gigahertz CPU would eventually get slowed down because of the slow RAM. And for example, a one gigahertz CPU coupled with a 100 nanosecond RAM would slow down the CPU to process just 10 million operations or instructions per second instead of the billion instructions it could do. Consequently, to improve the overall performance of the CPU, CPUs are engineered with RAM on the CPU, or and these are called caches, and these are very high-speed memories that are directly fabricated onto the CPU to reduce the latency to access data in RAM. Caches are used by CPU for all reads and write operations associated with processing instructions. When a piece of data or instruction is not present in a cache, the CPU first creates space in the cache, if the cache is full, by copying a block of data to RAM. Then the CPU fetches the necessary block of data from memory into the cache and then uses the data in the cache for further operations. Caches are small but high-speed memory that are directly manufactured or fabricated on the CPU to reduce or hide the memory latency. Typically, there's a hierarchy of caches to provide a better balance between cost of manufacturing, power consumption, and the overall performance of the CPU. These caches are typically labeled L1, L2, L3, with level 1 being the closest to the ALU and level 3 being closest to the RAM. Um, lower level caches are typically closer to the CPU, and L1 cache will be the one that's always closest to the ALU. Caches are always on the same die as the CPU to reduce access latencies and improve the overall speed of caches. The CPU always communicates via caches if they are present and doesn't directly interact with RAM. Caching cannot be turned off on modern CPUs, so programmers have to know that there is caching and they can optimize their code to make effective use of caches. Let's look at cache design from a hardware perspective. Reading or writing data to RAM is slow, that is, there is a high latency so interactions with RAM are designed to occur in consecutive blocks, typically of 8 to 32 bytes. Caches correspondingly store blocks of data. This is called a cache block or a cache line. So for example, the i7 uses 192 bits of cache lines. Now let's take a scenario where the ALU needs access to some block of data in memory. Let us assume that the cache does not have that block of data. So first, the, a space is created in the cache line by moving the least recently used of block of data to RAM. Then the requested block of data is copied from RAM to a free cache line. And then the ALU uses the necessary data block from the cache line. Bulk transfers between RAM and cache in terms of in blocks are used to reduce the number of interactions with the RAM and to increase the overall bandwidth of the data that can be moved between the CPU and RAM. Let's look at cache design from a software perspective. Caches are designed to take advantage of this concept of locality of reference that is inherent in programs. That is, programs tend to access memory locations both in space and time in a deterministic pattern. There are three distinct types of localities of references in programs. The first one is called temporal locality of reference. Temporal deals with time, and the concept of temporal locality of reference basically indicates that a memory location that is recently referenced 
at one point in time will be referenced again soon in an in time and this concept is often used in loops and other uh, looping constructs where the same set of instructions are executed over and over um, in in a loop spatial locality of reference basically refers to the likelihood of referencing memory locations that is adjacent to each other for example when arrays of vectors are processed typically programs tend to access consecutive elements and this idea fits very well with blocks of uh, data being moved between caches and uh, RAM and this leads to the spatial locality of reference. The third type of locality of reference is sequential locality of reference. This is the concept that memory is predominantly accessed in a sequential manner particularly when executing instructions and programs. Typically the CPU will go and fetch the next instruction to be processed and this results in a sequential access of instructions in memory. Let's look at an actual cache architecture and this is a typical example of a CPU which has three levels or three tiers of caches. The first tier of cache, the L1 cache, is typically the fastest but smallest and it uses a split design because at this level instructions and data typically have very different localities of reference or access patterns so it makes sense to split them into instructions and data caches separately. The next tier of cache is the L2 cache. Here it's a unified cache where instructions and data are stored in one cache. The L1 and L2 caches are on a per core basis so if a CPU has multiple cores they will typically have multiple independent L1 and L2 caches for each core on the CPU. The L3 cache is a shared cache that is shared between multiple cores on a CPU. It is typically the largest but the slowest cache on a CPU and it's shared by all of the cores on the CPU. So all interactions between the ALU and the RAM happen through, happens through these tiers of caches. Let's look at the cache from an actual hardware uh, CPU die perspective. There are multiple caches here. So you will see the L1 cache that's on a per core basis. You will also observe the L2 caches. And there's a large shared L3 cache on the die. Keep in notice that substantial portions of the silicon in a CPU is dedicated to fabrication of the caches. So caching is a important part of that CPU. Typically, caching cannot be turned off, so the, in order to get efficiency and performance out of the CPU, the programmer needs to be aware of these caching and develop code that is cache-friendly. Caches can have a conspicuous impact on the runtime of programs. So in some cases, there can be like a 10x difference in the overall runtime just by merely restructuring the program slightly. Keep in mind that caching does not affect the time complexity or the big O of an algorithm, but reduces the runtime constants in that algorithm. Caching has a conspicuous impact, particularly when operating with large matrices. Matrix operations are very common for image and video processing, so it's not just for matrices, but it has a lot of applications. When working with matrices, row-wise axes will typically work better than column-wise axes, because matrices tend to be stored in a row major fashion in memory. So for example, think of RAM as a flat set of bytes where each byte is accessed using a unique address or a number. Um, think, so RAM is, can be thought of as a one dimensional array of bytes where the address serves as an index into that array or RAM. The actual hardware is designed to operate on a on a per word basis, so typically a word can be eight bytes. So accessing memory at word boundaries or multiples of eight will typically be fastest, and other access will be a little bit slower as extra cycles may be needed to access adjacent words in memory to get the different bytes that are necessary. Now consider a matrix, a four by four matrix. Here, matrices are typically stored in a row major fashion, that is row by row, so the first row is stored in memory, followed by the second row, the third, and the fourth. And this having a mental model of the row major layout in memory is important when working with caches. Now let's 
look think about a column major axis of the data for some processing from memory so the column major axis is going to act axis the first element of each column followed by the second element and so on notice that when accessing an element in memory first the ALU needs the first piece of data but it's not in cache so that piece of memory is copied to the cache line and the ALU uses that data block in the next iteration of this for loop the next item in the second row the first uh, item in the second row of the matrix is axis and that information is not in cache so it's first copied to cache and then the ALU uses the data block now let's look at the same operation on the third row on the first column again the ALU needs the data block but it's not in cache but now the cache line is full so the data is first copied to memory and then the necessary block of data is copied from memory into cache and then the ALU accesses that information now when the iteration goes to the fourth row of the matrix again you're accessing the fourth row first column it is not in cache and the cache is full so the cache needs to be cleared by copying data back to memory a new piece of data needs to be copied from RAM into cache and the ALU can use that piece of data notice that in every iteration of this the top level loop um, for column zero every row access results in a cache miss and this operation continues to occur so for example let us say we are going to now access the second column back to the first row now again notice that the cache is full so one data block based on LRU operation is copied back to memory then the data is fetched from memory and the ALU can use the necessary block of data notice that every step of the way we keep having cache misses so every access to memory practically results in a cache miss resulting in very poor performance of a column major access pattern because the matrix is stored in a row major fashion in memory now let's look at an alternative code where we have simply changed the iteration so in this the four loops for row and column have been switched so now we have a row major access pattern so the first time we access the first block it's a cache miss and the block of data needs to be copied from memory into cache so that and the ALU can use it now when we access the second column in the first row as part of the row major axis notice that that block of data is already in cache and this results in a cache hit and the ALU can immediately use the data block for processing similarly when we access the third column in the first row of the matrix again it's a cache hit because the data block is in memory and the ALU can readily use the data block for performing operations of course the access to the fourth column will result in a cache miss however in this scenario we have already reduced the cache miss by a third significantly improving the performance of the um, program here we have observed only one tier of the cache but keep in mind that when there are multiple tiers the same strategy applies to each tier of the cache so multiple tiers and larger caches enable further reduction in cache misses thereby improving the overall performance of programs assuming that they are being designed being cache optimal so keep in mind if you have multiple tiers um, of caches let's say ALU needs a data item and assume it's not um, first the ALU will check a, a given tier of the cache if the block data, data block is in the cache it's a cache hit and the ALU will use it typically a 90% cache hit is recommended for efficient and good performance if the data block is not in a specific tier of the cache the data is copied from the next tier so if it is not an L, L1 cache it will be copied from L2 to L1 cache this of course results in a cache miss scenario at that cache tier and also it's important to keep in mind that even if only one byte of data is needed a block of data is moved between caches so it is important to work with consecutive data um, 
blocks or consecutive data elements stored in a block to efficiently use caches. A similar idea of working with blocks applies to matrix operations. So typically, iterating over a full matrix, either along a row, even if it is a row major axis, is not cache friendly because after some point in time, you're going to have cache misses. So in order to effectively use caches, matrix operations are typically performed in blocks. So for example, this matrix is logically divided into blocks, uh, let's say of uh, block sizes are 10 by 10, and the loops are logically structured to iterate over blocks of data in a matrix. Keep in mind, blocks are logical or conceptual, so all we are doing is tweaking the for loop ranges so that we iterate over blocks at a time rather than iterating over the whole matrix. And iterating over blocks improves caching behavior, thereby improving the performance of the program. Keep in mind, block operations do not and should not affect the overall functionality. So what they really do is significantly improve performance by effectively using caches. So in summary, caches are key or integral components of the CPU and considerable portion of the CPU die is dedicated to caching. So it is important to understand caches. They strongly influence the performance and efficiency of programs and the overall efficiency that you can derive from a given CPU. So as programmers, you need to be aware to develop cache-aware solutions and writing cache-aware uh, implementations for algorithms. It is very critical for games and image or video processing where you want to deliver frames at a given rate or speed. It is also important for big data analytics. If you have plenty of data that you're moving between CPU and RAM, you want to be cache aware for those operations. And working with caches or understanding caches is where has an influential uh, impact on energy efficiency and how much energy you take to do these operations. Um, keep in mind this presentation only covered the key concept of caching. There are other concepts like fault sharing, etc that are also important, and those become important when you delve into details of multi-threaded programs and such. Caching concept is also applicable to disk buffers and other buffers that programs use to reduce latency, particularly for input-output operations between disk and memory. So similar caching concept is used by web browsers to cache images and such. Uh, databases use same concept to cache uh, data between disk and memory so they can respond to queries faster. And similar software caches are used in other systems to improve overall performance of these systems. So caching is an important concept to keep in mind both at a hardware level and also at a software level in order to design performant and efficient programs.